Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anath Admati, and I'm the faculty director of the Corporation Society Initiative, CASI, here at Stanford uh, Business School. That's about three and a half year old initiative. Before there was the initiative, uh, there was a visitors program by a similar name, and our two visitors today both came here for a week each um, in 2017 and 2018 uh, and spent a week uh, hanging here. Um, and then uh, exactly three years ago, our main speaker, uh, Judge Rakoff, uh, participated in a panel right here that was entitled From Wells Fargo to Tesla, Scandal, Success, and Accountability in Corporate America, in which the other two panelists were the previous two speakers of Cassie this uh, February, uh, Emily Glazer, who was a Wall Street Journal reporter on Wells Fargo, and Fami Kadir, who is a short seller, uh, who at the time was already short selling Wirecard, and she spoke about that last week here. So this February, three years later, we have the three of them coming separately here. And we are so fortunate as well to have Bethany McLean, who since her visit here became uh, also a fixture, as did uh, Judge Rakoff, uh, coming to the accounting uh, course every year. Um, for, so all MBA students see her, and therefore I can no longer invite her to my MBA classes. Uh, but I can invite her to a Cassie event to moderate at least. Uh, and, uh, and so we're lucky that, she, that both of them were here in person. Thanks as well to uh, Judge Rakoff teaching uh, a course, a short course at Berkeley um, in the in coming uh, few days, which he does every year, bringing him to the West Coast. The uh, bio is very long, and I don't want to take up time. Uh, Judge Rakoff spent, uh, has degrees from Swarthmore and Oxford, spent uh, seven years in prosecution, Southern District of New York, uh, seven years there, 17 years in uh, uh, private law. Uh, defending uh, individuals, corporations, uh, et cetera, and now 26 years on the bench at the Southern District uh, of New York, where he's now a senior uh, judge. Uh, and Bethany McLean is uh, very famous around the business school, of course, and the entire business community, uh, especially ever since her uh, understatement of the decade at least, uh, is Enron overpriced uh, in a story she wrote a few months before uh, Enron's collapse, which uh, then made her the natural person to write that story, The Smartest Guys in the Room, which was also a documentary, and she's uh, most recently uh, was able, because she's a free uh, commenting person, to discuss Theranos and cases of this sort, which... Uh, which Judge Rakoff cannot comment on because it's still under appeal. Uh, however, uh, Theranos brings up uh, one of the topics of the day, which is, uh, you know, where is the line between, you know, deception, who are you deceiving, and what's the law going to do about it, or what is uh, the role of, uh, you know, business investors uh, and others in, uh, in in sort of dealing with uh, with deception. Uh, however. Uh, it, it sort of is exactly uh, synonymous with other with other things that are you know not allowed somehow, uh, or maybe they're just uh, hype and vision. So I'm going to let Bethany take it from here and uh, and she uh, engage with Judge Rakoff and then uh, maybe take a few questions. Thank you so much uh, for both of you. Thank you so much for having us here, Anat, and thank you for that lovely introduction. So let's start right there, where Anat left, left off. One of the things I've thought about over a lot of years of covering business gone wrong is where the law is equipped to deal with wrongdoing and, and where it isn't. And that sometimes the what strikes me as the worst cases of wrongdoing, the, the, the moral crimes, the law is not necessarily equipped to, to, to prosecute. How do, you, how do you feel about that? Is the criminal law set up to get at the kinds of wrongdoing we would, we would like it to? Well, uh, the criminal law has uh, evolved, but it still uh, doesn't purport to cover every uh, moral lapse. And indeed, I think it would be uh, um, not a good thing for it to cover every moral lapse because we'd all be in jail. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, uh, uh, the law of fraud has evolved as follows. Back in England in the uh, early Renaissance and the rise of commercial activity, 
um, you could not be uh, prosecuted or even sued for fraud unless it was shown that you had purposely told affirmative lies that uh, people that your victims had relied upon. And that was a high standard, and the theory was that we are trying to foster the growth of commerce, this being, again, in the early uh, period, and uh, we don't want uh, people, every time they're dissatisfied customers, suing for fraud. Um, but uh, as corporations evolved in the 19th century, um, people began to realize that uh, a lot of fraud is accomplished through uh, not saying things that need to be said. Um, and this came to a head in the uh, New Deal when Congress uh, passed laws, the Securities Act and the Securities Exchange Act, um, that basically said that a uh, half-truth, a failure to reveal something that needs to be revealed because you're otherwise creating a false picture uh, is punishable, both civilly and criminally. Um, the, uh, it's worth noting in this regard that the federal government only deals with a limited portion of corporate law. Most corporate law is the law of the state of Delaware. Um, and the law of the state of Delaware came, the fact that it's the law of Delaware came about because there was a big competition in the uh, late 19th century between uh, Delaware and New Jersey uh, to see who could attract the most companies. <laughs> Delaware won by saying, we will reduce our corporate taxes to zero. The first race to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and Delaware has been very favorable to um, corporations. So, for example, there's the so-called business judgment rule, which was a creation of uh, Delaware, uh, which says that even if you did something arguably wrong, if you were exercising reasonable business judgment, it's okay. Um, so a lot of what would uh, be considered immoral conduct, for lack of a better word, or improper conduct, is still not punishable, but if it goes as far as fraud, then the federal government can step in. So when you look at where we are, do you think the law can go far enough in punishing cases of deception? When we look at a case and say, but that, but that is deceptive in common sense terms, and yet there's no way to get there, uh, the law doesn't seem to offer a way to get there. Well, uh, I think the law should go further, but I must say I think that um, uh, much of the problem lies with not the courts, but the legislatures. Um, the uh, looking at it with a hard-nosed, cynical view, uh, politics, even in my lifetime, have become ever more a function of money. And we all know that whereas back in, say, 1950, the top 1% of uh, the United States, uh, in income terms, uh, held 10% of the companies. Uh, I'm sorry, the one, the top 1% 1 of people held 10% of the uh, company of the country's wealth. The top 1% of uh, the country now holds 33% of the one third of the country's wealth, and those are the people, and many of them are corporate executives who politicians have to go to uh, to survive. And so uh, I really think the problem uh, that you're alluding to lies more with uh, uh, our financial arrangements in politics than it does with um, uh, the failure of the courts. 
It's really interesting. You mentioned in class, uh, in the class previously, and it was something I had not thought about before, that the growing inequality in the United States, as well as the growing short-term nature of securities ownerships, of securities ownership, are both both problems for the law, in a sense, or, or, or hurdles for the law. And maybe address that a bit, because it was something that had not occurred to me, and I think it's really interesting. So, uh, again, I'm, I'm using 1950 uh, because uh, I'm the only one in this room who was alive in 1950. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, uh, in 1950, 90% um, of all publicly traded securities uh, were owned by individual investors. It was one of the, back in those days, one of the glories of the American economy. Everyone had a share. Um, now, 90% of all publicly traded securities um, are held by institutional investors, mutual funds, uh, pension plans, and so forth. And they have a very different outlook on what they want. They want short-term profits. So back in 1950, the average investor held those shares for seven years. Today, the average investor, who's now an institution, holds those shares for seven months. And that's because um, they will shift rapidly with the help of algorithms and the like uh, uh, if they're not getting as good a return from X as they could get from Y. And uh, that may make total sense economically, but it leads to a different viewpoint in terms of corporate governance and the relationship between corporate executives and their shareholders, the pressure now for short-term profits is much, much greater than it was in the uh, 1950s. And the, another element that I would mention is that our economy is increasingly not subject to federal regulation because of privatization. So uh, there was a speech given by a member of the SEC just a few months ago, which you pointed out that we've now uh, reached the point where more of our capital is raised in private placements than is raised in public IPOs and the like. And the result of that is it's subject to far less regulation uh, because mo most of the relevant federal laws apply uh, to, mainly apply to publicly traded markets where you can demand disclosures that you can't demand in private situations. It's actually fascinating when you think back to the laws that were put in place, Sarbanes-Oxley and then Dodd-Frank as methods of making the public market safer for average investors. And the evolution of the markets in that time has been away from those very public markets. And exactly. I, they're either correlated or one is causal. I'm, or causal, I'm not quite sure which one. Um, backing up a little bit, you, you were a prosecutor and then you've been a judge for, for many years. And you talk in the book you wrote, Why the Innocent Plead Guilty and the Guilty Go Free, about a essentially losing faith in, in the system as it is. How much, can you talk about key turning points in, in, in over, over those years? And how much of this do you think is changes in you as you saw the, the way in which the law worked in the real world? And how much do you think has been changes in our system, such as the ones we've just been, been discussing and changes in our society? Well, both. Um, I had a, in hindsight, uh, a naive view of the legal system in the United States, even after I had practiced as a prosecutor and a defense lawyer for 25 years. Um, and basically I thought, as many other people have thought, uh, that it got the right answer most of the time. Uh, a very great, famous judge, Learned Hand, in 1923 issued an opinion in which he said, of uh, the uh, possibility of an innocent person being convicted of a crime is a total myth. We have all these protections under our Constitution, the Fifth Amendment, the right to jury, the presumption of innocence, the right to silence, and so forth. It just doesn't happen. Well, we now know that it happens quite regularly. But the biggest um, revelation to me 
was to see the fruits of mass incarceration in my own court. So as uh, many of you probably know, the United States is the world's leader overwhelmingly in the number of people that we send to jail and prison. Uh, we, since the year 2000, we've averaged about two million a year. Uh, that is vastly more than uh, those countries we thumb our nose at, China and Russia and uh, other countries like that. Um, we are 5% of the world's population. We lock up 25% of the people who are locked up in the world. Um, and they are mostly persons of color. Uh, and they are almost all people who are poor. And I kept seeing in my court, still see, every day, every week, these people who um, you can understand how they got to commit the crimes they committed uh, because they had just terrible upbringings with the state totally failing to help them out in any uh, meaningful respect. And then, at the other extreme, we have corporate executives who commit wrongdoing, who the government for since about 2006 has chosen with virtually no meaningful exceptions not to prosecute at all. So when I became a judge, I took an oath to apply the law equally to rich or poor but the law in the United States is not being applied equally to rich or poor. It's being applied incredibly punitively to the poor and applied incredibly without being applied, really, to the rich. Uh, uh, applied by absence, if you will. Um, and the more I saw that in my court, uh, the more... Uh, it bothered me uh, because I had been deluded into thinking the system was better than it was. You write in your book, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that our otherwise very aggressive criminal justice system gives a pass to those who can take advantage of a corporate shield. I was thinking about what you, what you just said and wondering, is it is it too blunt to say that our system is getting harder and harder on, on, on people, the underprivileged, who go through the criminal justice system, but easier and easier on executives and corporations? Yes, I think that's a fair generalization. Now, um, uh, the, um, uh, I want to distinguish between corporations and corporate executives. Uh, it's become routine in the federal system, and that's where most of the, if you will, big corporate frauds wind up, to go after the company, but not the top executives. And um, this has been true both under the Obama administration, under the Trump administration. There's a little bit of a sense it might be about to change under the Biden administration. I'll mention that in a minute. But the uh, uh, going after the company is, in my view, a mistake in two respects. First, the company, while technically liable under the law, uh, is not the person who committed the crime. There are human beings who made the decision to either commit the crimes or to overlook the people under them were committing the crimes. And they are the people who broke the law and ought to go to jail. The, the, um, uh, uh, so uh, the company just provides, a, if you will, a, a target that it's easy to point fingers at. Also, the people who pay the fines ultimately are the shareholders who are almost always totally innocent of the crimes involved. Yes, they may have benefited financially, but that can be dealt with through civil lawsuits. Uh, the criminal law is really designed to deal with morally improper conduct. 
it wasn't this abstract thing, the corporation, that committed the wrong conduct, though under agency doctrine of law it is responsible. It was human beings, high and low, who made the decisions. And I think they made those wrongful decisions because on the pressure for short-term profits, on the fact that under, for example, the business judgment rule of Delaware, they can largely get away with it, and increasingly because they know they won't be prosecuted, period. Um, so um, the, the, to my mind, that's a, a major failing. How did we get there? I mean, when you think about it in simplistic terms, it seems absolutely insane that you could have wrongdoing at a corporation without any human beings actually doing anything wrong. I mean, how, 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 did, how did that happen? Ghosts, right? <laughs> right, ghosts in the machine. <laughs> the, uh, so it used to be the case that the federal government went after high-level executives who either had themselves orchestrated or allowed others to orchestrate serious financial crimes. And thus you had uh, the prosecution of Enron, <laughs> uh, WorldCom. This, these were the prosecutions of the CEOs. Bernie Evers, the head, the CEO of, of WorldCom, went to prison for 25 years. The CEO of uh, Enron went to prison. The CEO of Tyco went to prison. The CEO of Adelphi went to prison. In the savings and loan crisis, something like 280 people went to prison, uh, all the way up to Mr. Keating, who was the, the top guy in that particular fraud. And um, this changed, hard to put an exact date on it, but sometime around 2005, 2006, uh, just as the, some of these most famous prosecutions were ending, um, when uh, the government chose largely and originally for resource management reasons to only go after the corporation. It's such an easy thing to go after the corporation because under federal law, the crime of even a low-level person is imputed automatically, automatically to the uh, corporation. So you would, uh, if you were a prosecutor, you would learn often from the press that some low-level guy had committed a accounting fraud, let's say, fix the books in some particular respect. And you would now have a case against the corporation automatically. So you would bring in the lawyer for the company, who typically was a former colleague of yours, a typical outside lawyer would be a former federal prosecutor from the same office, uh, and uh, he or she would say, uh, we'll, we want to do everything that's right, we will undertake an investigation and uh, give you the results in six months and we'll spend millions of dollars on it. And the feeling even at the low level, but particularly at the higher level, was great. We've got a bunch of other things we've got to deal with. We are spending a lot of uh, person power on anti-terrorism and cryptocurrency problems and other newly developed problems. Uh, here's one way to uh, save resources. And then the company's lawyer would come back after six months, uh, and a big fee, by the way, uh, and uh, uh, say, oh, yes, there were some problems at uh, a low level, but we fire those people or we've disciplined those people, and uh, we don't think the company should pay uh, at all. Uh, after all, our shareholders were totally innocent. And then there would begin a negotiation well, maybe the company does have to plead guilty to at least something so that we can tell the public we've done something, not that it was ever said in that way. Um, and ultimately, you would have either a deferred prosecution or an outright prosecution uh, with a big press conference. And uh, 
Today, Company X is paying a fine of $2 million and is instituting new compliance measures. Uh, and, of course, we're not uh, foregoing the possibility that we'll go after some high-level executive. But they never did, and they never could, because they hadn't done any of the legwork. They didn't have independent people doing the investigation. They were totally dependent on what they got from the uh, outside camp, outside counsel. So I've come to think of um, deferred prosecution agreements of the, the and, and this setup as a sort of wink, wink, nod, nod extortion, uh, extortion system in which the government gets to get the corporation to pay some kind of big fine, and the corporation is willing to do that because the big fine comes out of the pocket of shareholders, not out of any of their pockets, and everybody just smiles and nods and collects a fee and, and moves on. Is, is that too cynical? Oh, you can never be too cynical. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, uh, I, th I think that's uh, essentially a correct picture. And now, in fairness, the department over the last seven or eight years has moved more towards outright guilty pleas and away from deferred prosecutions. They had, in the years between 2000 and a few years ago, something like uh, over almost 300 deferred prosecutions. Uh, and those were uh, the subject of a very good study by Brandon Garrett of Duke Law School, which called Too Big to Jail, in which he showed those were really ineffective. Lisa Monaco, the current Deputy Attorney General of the United States, recently gave in October a very important speech, I think, about the need to go after individuals. Uh, but she also pointed out in the course of that speech that something between 10 and 20 percent of those companies that it had entered into deferred prosecutions had then committed new crimes. Um, so a high, high level of recidivism, uh, and of course she didn't say this in her speech, but in virtually every one of those deferred prosecution press conferences, the company said, we're terribly sorry this happened. We will never, ever do it again. And we have put in place compliance measures that will prevent it ever happening again. And that hasn't proven to be the case in too many cases. You talked in your book about the example of Pfizer, and maybe it's worth spending a few minutes on that here, about the, and some of the stats in your book from Brandon Garrett's study are quite amazing. I think he said that in two-thirds of the cases involving deferred prosecutions or non-prosecution agreements, um, the companies were, were, were punished, but no employees were prosecuted, and I think the, the numbers were 50 percent recidivism. Anyway, but maybe talk about that data through the lens of Pfizer and what it, what it showed you. Yeah, well, of course, uh, uh, Right now, Pfizer is uh, a hero uh, <laughs> as a company uh, for obvious reasons, but uh, Pfizer, uh, way back uh, uh, when, entered into uh, not just one, but a series of deferred prosecutions, each time promising this was the end and we would never do it again. And you may wonder, why did the government keep giving them deferred prosecutions as opposed to taking stronger steps. And the reason uh, is that uh, under federal law, a pharmaceutical company uh, that enters a guilty plea to a felony uh, can, uh, it's not an automatic, but uh, can often be barred from selling prescription drugs to the public, which would of course put Pfizer out of business. Uh, so the prosecutors didn't want to have that happen, so they said, okay, we're really mad that you did this again. We're going to up the fine to more. We'll give you a new deferred prosecution. We'll put in more compliance measures. And that didn't stop Pfizer from continuing to break the law uh, because it was in their economic interest to do so. Um, notice that all those dilemmas that the prosecutor faced don't happen when you go after individuals. When, uh, uh, you, when you go after a high-level individual, you don't have to worry, this is going to put thousands of people out of, out of work or it's going to have the company collapse or any of those things that were present in the Pfizer kind of situation. You're just going after the guy who done it, so to speak. 
uh, or who allowed, knowingly allowed others to do it. Um, uh, so these are self-created dilemmas in my view and they've led to, as Pfizer illustrates, a, a, a really hypocritical situation where a company is claiming, we're sorry, we'll never do it again, and then two years later they do it again. Would one solution to that be to simply um, abolish the idea of prosecuting the corporation and only prosecute individuals instead? Well, or is there a place for yeah, corporate prosecution? You know, it's uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I think every case is different, uh, and it's. Uh, uh, but I think there is something to be said for not prosecuting companies particularly where you can go after the high-level individuals. Um, the, um, uh, the the going after the company does serve some symbolic purposes. It does bring to the attention of the public in a way that it hasn't br been brought that this, there were people in this company who seriously broke the law. Uh, uh, but, as I say, who really pays? It's the innocent shareholders. Yes, sometimes they have benefited financially from the crime, but that can be the subject of civil uh, lawsuits, and typically is. Um, and uh, the other thing that come, can come about is a, quote, change in corporate culture by instituting compliance measures. All the people I've talked to say that one of the reasons that compliance measures haven't been effective in so many cases is it's just viewed as a checklist. Uh, there's the government says, oh, we got to check that box, so we'll check that box. But if we're going to make money, we still have to find ways to, to do it that may push the law or go beyond the law. Uh, so in, in my view, um, I wouldn't think it would be the end of the world doing away with corporate criminal prosecutions if we return to the practice of making cases against high-level uh, individuals. Uh, but that's the big if. Can we pause on that? This is going to sound like a very naive question, but I actually did think... And I don't believe <laughs> any question you would ask is not naive. <laughs> I actually did think that the Justice Department was supposed to be independent, and it's interesting in light of this new memo, new guidance from Lisa Monaco about prosecuting individuals. Similar guidance was given in the waning years of the Obama administration by Sally Yates. And yet, as you discussed earlier in class, once the Trump administration came in, that guidance effectively was 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 sidestepped. And so, how do you how do you think about how much how do you think about how much justice seems to be wound up with politics? Well, um, I think it's inevitable that the highest levels um, uh, there will be a lot of interrelationship between justice and politics. It's not a good thing, but there it is. The Attorney General of the United States for 200 years has been a buddy of the president, often his one of his main political guys. Uh, uh, the the um, so uh, this is not exactly new. Um, uh, in the Obama administration, the decision not to go after uh, high-level executives was mainly made by people near the top or at the top of the Department of Justice, not by the line assistants. Uh, and they were people who had spent uh, 20, 30 years uh, in private practice defending uh, companies and were sensitive to the uh, situation. I love that word, sensitive. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, Sally Yates, who I have a tremendous respect for, issued her memorandum right before the end of the Obama administration. And I think it's not unrealistic to think that it was prompted in part by political reasons because of the public concern that there hadn't been any prosecutions of high-level individuals. So she said, among other things, that if a company 
that was doing a deal with the government wanted leniency, they had to provide all the information that their outside counsel had found about individuals, whether high or low. The Trump administration almost immediately changed this to they only had to provide uh, information uh, about people who were substantially involved in the crime. And the word substantially is a weasel word that can mean a lot or a little. Uh, and uh, the, uh, that has only just changed this past October in the speech that uh, uh, the new Deputy Attorney General gave, and we'll see whether it has effect or not. Um, but notice, even giving tremendous credit to both Sally Yates and Lisa Monaco, they are both saying we are dependent on what the outside counsel turns up. That's not the way it should be. The way you should prosecute these cases is the way we still prosecute drug cases, the way we still prosecute mob cases, and the way we used to prosecute corporate cases, which is you start at the low level and you spend the two or three years with lots of people and lots of hours, and you work yourself you work up as high as you can go. Sometimes it goes to the top, sometimes it doesn't. Those are the way it is, but that's the way, then you don't have to depend on what the company is t telling you. Uh, you have your own investigation to rely on. So the underlying theme here is one of the revolving door, and that's uh, uh, my, my colleague Jesse Eisinger wrote about that in the Chicken Shit Club. It's a problem throughout the world of regulation. I've always been a little bit torn about it in, in the legal field, and I know there is no, no door more revolving than that between uh, the, uh, um, uh, U.S. attorney's offices and big big law firms. And yet, in some ways, there's, there's a benefit to this in that people who have been on the inside of the system understand how the system works. And yet, there's a cost to it as well. And so, how do you, how do you weigh those trade-offs between the benefit of understanding the system and the costs involved, in 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 the the the, the sort of implicit corruption that can happen as a result of that? Yeah, and that's not uh, an easy question to answer. There, there, uh, there's an apocryphal story. Uh, it's existed for many years that when Franklin Roosevelt appointed. Joe Kennedy to be the chairman of the SEC when it was well known that Joe Kennedy, the father of Jack Kennedy, had engaged in questionable financial dealings, uh, FDR uh, said, in effect, uh, it, uh, uh, a real crook can know how other crooks operate. Um, so um, the, I don't know if that story is true. Um, it better but, be. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the, the point is, going in the opposite direction. If you're a young prosecutor and you get one of these cases, there are two emotions coursing through your veins. One is moral outrage. Wells Fargo created millions of fictitious accounts. We've got to find out how that could happen. Surely there was someone higher up who knew that was going on when it was that widespread. But there's also human beings being as they are. And yes, if I make this case, I will be the most famous prosecutor uh, of the moment uh, and get a big uh, uh, partnership in a big law firm. Right. Um, so that's the conflict at the lower level. At the higher level, it's much more, I think, sophisticated, but also just as real, um, and it cuts the other direction. Um, the uh, uh, yes, uh, I want to have the political benefit of bringing to justice uh, uh, someone in this case uh, involving millions of phony accounts. Uh, but on the other hand, I know from my 20 years of private practice that uh, uh, people often don't really know what's going on. Uh, co corporations are complex, uh, people are very busy, and we gotta be careful not to scapegoat people. Um, the, uh, so there, there are those 
um, differences. But the one thing that, about the revolving door that's different is those high-level people know that they will be going back to big law firms to represent the very same kinds of corp companies that they're dealing with there. And that they will have be dealing on a day-to-day -day basis, not with the company in the abstract, but with the general counsel and the high-level executives. Uh, and uh, that, I think, can't help but uh, impact them. And some proof of that is some of the statements that were made by high-level people in the Obama administration about why they weren't going after um, high-level executives. Uh, one statement which came from uh, Attorney General Holder, although he later walked it back, was uh, that in this perilous economic climate that we were in at the time, this would just make matters worse. Frankly, that's a, c a good argument for not going after the company. But it's a ridiculous argument for not going after the individual. Uh, uh, and then uh, 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 Lanny Brewer, the uh, head of, of um, uh, the criminal division of the Department of Justice, said, well, the reason we're not going after some of these high-level individuals is because um, we cannot show, among other things, that the victims really relied on the false statements that they allowed. To my mind, that was incredible that Mr. Brewer's a, a fine f fellow and all like that, but in criminal cases, you never have to show reliance. That's been the law of the United States and England for 500 years. You have to show reliance in civil cases, but not in criminal cases. Uh, so why were these excuses being given? I, ha I have to guess that unconsciously or subconsciously some of the lessons that had been absorbed in private practice were coming out in ways that were probably not defensible. That's, that's really interesting. I think if you do spend enough time in private practice, your friends become the CEOs and executives and just human nature through, through osmosis to absorb a certain amount of that worldview. So I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm gonna, we have a bunch of questions that have come in through Zoom and any of you who are in the room would like to ask a question, you also can raise your hand and I will call on you and we'll alternate between those and the questions that have come into EarFan via, via, via Zoom. But a, a last question from me that I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned Wells Fargo, and it's a case near and dear to my heart because I think it illuminates something, another aspect of all of this, which is that it's often the junior level people, in this case, the Wells Fargo, the people at the very bottom of the rung of Wells Fargo, the, the tellers, the, the, the people who worked in the banks, who were sort of forced, in, forced if they wanted to keep their jobs, to engage in the wrongdoing. And they were on the front lines of it, and yet they didn't benefit from it at all, other than that they got to keep their jobs. The upper level people were complicit in the system that was developed and, and knew about it, but were insulated from the wrongdoing by the layers of accountants and lawyers that said, ah, uh, you don't know, we've given the advice that this is okay. I mean, how can capitalism work in an environment like that, where the people at the very bottom are forced to take all the risk and get none of the rewards, and the people at the top get to insulate themselves from the risk and get all the rewards? Well, I, it's a, you correctly analyze a very difficult situation, but I do think capitalism will survive <laughs> with or without this. Uh, the, uh, 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 and I want to add, before I directly address your question, that I don't want to be misunderstood. For all its frailties, I think the American business community is still among the most honest overall of all business communities, much more so than some countries we could all name. And uh, it's a great asset. Uh, why do people want to invest in the American economy? Why do they want to invest in our stock markets? It's because they have confidence that most things will turn out to be honest and true and um, reliable. Um, nevertheless, the, uh, uh, it is absolutely correct that many financial crimes 
are committed in the sense of who did it, who made that wrong entry, who uh, created that false account by low-level employees who are operating under perceived pressure uh, and not because it's in it for them in it other than the, the, as you say, sometimes keeping their job. Um, the, and so how do we design a situation, a system, where the pressure will not exist? I mean, you always want your company to make a lot of money. You're, you know, we're, we always favor, in a general sense, hard-driving capitalists uh, who make us all more wealthy. But if that higher level person knows that if I don't make sure that everyone knows the one way to lose their job is to uh, do something improper, to some, that you've got to, if there's a close call, call it in favor of not doing that questionable activity, uh, or you will lose your job, that sends a totally different message. And that's why I come back at the risk of droning on uh, to prosecuting high-level executives. Because there, that creates a situation where some other executive who uh, is uh, confronted with a questionable situation will say to him or herself, I got to make sure this stops uh, uh, because otherwise I'll go to jail. And I don't really think I want to go to jail. Um, the, uh, and um, so uh, I think it creates a much greater deterrent effect than going after the company. So, Irfan, why don't I have you start with a question, and then I'll have anybody in the audience who has a question raise their hand next. Sure. So, with the first question we have, with the rise of shareholder activism, stakeholder capitalism, and other movements in defiance of Milton Friedman's thesis, what are perhaps the one or two most important changes to the legal architecture you'd like to see in order for all stakeholders to be better served? Well, I want to distinguish here between the so-called ESG movement which is doing wonderful things in many situations. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, systemic change, I would like to see federalization uh, of corporate governance. Uh, the, as I say, most of corporate law is Delaware law. And Delaware is a fine state. I understand they, some of their senators even go on to higher things. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, it has, uh, for uh, 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 more than 100 years, created laws uh, and decisions that were very favorable to high-level executives. And um, the... SEC has been much more independent within its bailiwick, uh, and there have been little changes in terms of corporate governance through federal legislation like Sarbanes-Oxley and uh, things like that, but uh, I would, if I had a magic wand, I would uh, take this power away from any state and give it to uh, the federal government, and I think you would find greater independence in that situation. Delaware is really dependent on being the corporate headquarters of so many companies, and that naturally impacts uh, how, it, how it approaches the law in this area. So that's, that's the uh, uh, change I would make. Do we have a question? For, go ahead, please. Dr. Rakoff, thank you so much for coming and your continued support of Stanford. I have a question about the recidivism that you talked about with corporations do something wrong and then do it again a couple of years later. Did the data show that it was the same individuals at the top who were repeating the, cr the crime, in which case it's kind of like the definition of insanity, <laughs> or were new people coming in and then repeating the crime as well, which would imply that human nature is such that everyone's going to be corrupt if they're responding to incentives? Do, were we able to tell... You know, well, it's a it's a question better put to Brandon 
Garrett than to me, but he had a much more hands-on feel. Uh, but uh, I think there were situations that fit both those patterns. I don't think it was all one or all the other. Uh, uh, frequently, uh, a company's first brush with a uh, deferred prosecution agreement situation would be uh, when it acquired a new subsidiary that was engaging in improper activity. And uh, then, but the, the company would then say, well, as part of this agreement, we're going to put in place compliance measures that will prevent it from ever happening again. Next time around, it was a different crime uh, by perhaps people at a different subsidiary, maybe not a new subsidiary, uh, uh, and therefore they weren't c caught by the compliance measures because it was a different kind of crime. Uh, but uh, taking Pfizer as an example, some of the crimes were so, so obvious. Uh, paying off uh, doctors to promote questionable drugs uh, with uh, you know, uh, concealed payments, um, uh, uh, bribes to foreign officials. But this is not like uh, complex, difficult crimes that you have to analyze carefully. These were obvious. Uh, but they were different uh, often. It was not always the same crime. Irfan, another Zoom question? Sure. The Theranos case has highlighted the deception unscrupulous entrepreneurs have employed to secure capital from investors. What about the other side of the coin? Here in Silicon Valley, investors have employed deception to gain valuable IP from entrepreneurs and exploited it by funding their own shadow teams. From personal experience, patent litigation is extremely expensive or onerous within the system for a small startup company to undertake or they become barred by statute of limitations. Can you please address if and how this inequity can be remedied? I'm, I'm, I didn't pick up all the details of, of the question. Uh, because for some odd reason you're wearing a mask. Um, <laughs> they, they, uh, uh, but g give me the, the heart of it again, if you would. Yeah, I, I guess the heart of the question is essentially, um, is there any action that can be taken to address the inequity between kind of small startups and investors who kind of steal some of the intellectual property oh, that the okay. startup mm. have? That's, that's a very good question, but not one that I can claim to have really analyzed. I'm a simple barefoot judge uh, the, the, and not an economist. So I only see this when it creeps into my court through either prosecution or prosecution agreements or failure to prosecute. Um, so I don't have a, a good answer uh, for that. Um, uh, the the um, um, which doesn't always stop me from opening my mouth, as my wife will tell you. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, I think I'm going to pass on that question. So I thought I would just close with 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 asking you to 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 muse a little bit about this is corporations and society and about the importance of the law to that. And what I, what I mean by that is I've often thought back on the great financial crisis and thought it really wasn't so much a financial crisis. I mean, it was, but it was also a societal crisis because it created a lot of cynicism about how our system works and about the prosecution of those who can help participate in causing great, great economic calamity. And I've thought about that when it comes to deferred prosecutions as, as well, because so much of the, the negotiating of these gets conducted in secret. Um, they're hammered out, as you mentioned, between lawyers for, for lawyers for the for the companies and the Justice Department. And when you read the agreement, you can't really tell what what happened. And it creates sort of a shadow justice system, which is the opposite of the transparency that our system is supposed to have. And you've you've taken such an activist role in in so many of these so many cases, um, which cannot have been easy given the prevailing forces <laughs> against it. And I think you have. Your either your PhD in philosophy, but I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the importance of the importance of the legal system, a legal system that people trust and believe in and believe is fair to the functioning not only of business but to society as a whole. 
So I think you rightly identify the financial crisis as uh, something that had deep psychological effects on the American public that have not totally dissipated. Here we had basically banks and mortgage institutions dressing up um, questionable mortgages as much better than they were and doing that by pulling them together and slicing them and then slicing the slices and so forth to the point that it was very difficult for even sophisticated bankers to fully understand what was going on. Uh, but it had at its uh, heart fraud. And the uh, uh, what was what were the results? Well, first, a whole bunch of people were induced to enter into mortgages, so-called liars' loans, that they had no business entering into and wound up losing their homes. And if you've ever witnessed a foreclosure, then you know what it is to cry because it is a painful, painful thing. And then, because this became so widespread, Millions of people lost their jobs because of the impact on the economy and uh, the stock market and so forth. Um, and uh, sure, eventually many of them found new jobs, but not without undergoing great uh, economic hardship, and it took quite a few years. Uh, and uh, then um, the uh, people thought people realize that major financial institutions that they took for granted were uh, not subject to the uh, kind of get-rich-quick uh, uh, needs of, of more fly-by-night corporations had to willy-nilly engage in just these frauds. Uh, there was testimony given by the uh, CEO of Citibank and Congress, and I can't remember the exact words, but he was asked, did you know what was going on? And he said something like, well, when everyone is dancing, you, you're you not the one who says stop the music. Um, and uh, so um, I, I think uh, that was in the end a total failure to deal with fraud that had been created over years and billions of, of dollars. And at no stage did the government deal with it, and even after the fact, the government did not deal with it in terms of the prosecutions that I've referenced. Um, and so um, you do wonder if how strong is our government in dealing with corporations and corporate misconduct if it can't deal with it at the, cre the fraud at the creation, if it can't deal with the fraud at the culmination, uh, and if it can't deal with uh, ascertaining and prosecuting the people responsible. So I do think it was a cynical, a, a cynic raising uh, situation. Well, thank you so much for being here with us, and thank you for those answers. I wish we had ended on a more optimistic note. <laughs> so my apologies. I could have steered the conversation toward a happy ending, but I guess I didn't. Um, anyway, but I've learned a lot from this conversation, so thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.